Hello and welcome to Distributed Systems. My name is Thomas Bocek and today we are going to talk with Simon Tuck, who is from Trust Square. We will be talking about Certify, which is a large EU project and there we are building a system with different use cases and we'll be talking about distributed systems and complexity within this Certify project. Today with me, I have Simon Tuck. Thanks for being here. I don't need to introduce myself. Uh, you all know me, but maybe Simon, can you briefly introduce yourself? Sure. Thank you for having me. I'm uh, very glad to be here. My name is Simon Tuck. I work for Trustware. Um, at the moment, we're working on a project called Artwork ID, which I'm sure we'll go into into more detail. And um, um, we've been collaborating on this project. I've been working on the Certify project, and the Certify project is a EU-sponsored project. It's the following site here. It has an awesome abbreviation, um, Active Security for Connected Devices Life Cycle. Uh, in short, Certify. Um, if you ever need an abbreviation, um, ask your local scientist. And uh, Certify, it's about security for IoT devices. So uh, making sure that if they have flaws in there, it, it's getting um, marked as um, there's a potential security flaw. And at the next point where this IoT device is handled, it gets then sorted out and can be, I don't know, reflashed or even thrown away because uh, maybe uh, there's a hardware issue as well. So it, it, that it, it's a framework about this security where uh, the idea is to have secure devices. And uh, in this use case uh, with, uh, with artwork, um, of course, if the art has some value, it's important to have a secure system. So that's why um, this art link, I think it's a good project. There are quite so many academic partners, but also industry partners like, uh, for example, Trust Square. And uh, can you tell us a bit more about what this art link is or this art tracking and uh, what the motivation is or why do we need this, this artwork? Yeah, so um, this is something which happens all the time um, this in the art world that you have artworks being shipped between museums between galleries um, and it's a very complicated process it's expensive and it's also risky right because there is a valuable objects which, which are being transported and so the artwork id uh, platform will aim to, to simplify it, to digitalize it, and to reduce the risk, to make them, the risks more transparent. And it's also um, the, the, the process of bringing one artwork from one place to the other. You mentioned it, it's a bit cumbersome. So how many steps, or can you briefly walk us through from the artwork owner maybe to the museum. Um, so how does this process look like? Yeah. So typically you would have, uh, let's say you, you're, you're a museum in, in Miami and you have cultural objects there, um, very valuable, very rare. Uh, a museum in Berlin is organizing an exhibition they speak to you and say, hey, it would be great if we could have this object, we're doing an exhibition, etc., etc., which would then kick off this process. So eventually you, you want the object in the museum at Berlin for the exhibition. You, how do you get there? There's a lot of paperwork, there are a lot of parties involved, there are um, laws, rules and regulations, customs agency, there's insurance. Um, shipping agents, and then of course the um, the museums, borrowing and lending museums. This is very heterogeneous process, different different regulations, um, and what we want to do is kind of reduce the the complexity there, make it very easy to collect this information, to present the information, and also on top of that 
we want to provide a level of tracking so that mm -hmm. uh, because a lot of damage happens to artwork during transit and we want to, to make sure that the, the health of the object during transit is continuously monitored so we can see what's happening. Okay, you mentioned there's a heterogeneous uh, process. It involves uh, lots of manual steps. So if, if I, for example, imagine there's, there's customs, maybe in the US there are customs, in Switzerland, for example, um, I'm sure they have different systems. I don't know their systems, but I'm sure they're not compatible. So how do you plan to bridge this? Or are there any kind of standards? Or are you pushing for standards? So there, there are um, a lot of standards which are being developed, um, are constantly being revised. There's a, an international body um, called ICOM, which is heavily involved. Um, there are also then regional, national bodies which are involved. And of course, as you mentioned, every government will have its own set of rules and regulations. So uh, um, customs form in Switzerland typically will not be compatible with one in Korea or wherever. That's, yeah. But um, these, these uh, standards are being developed as I mentioned, by ICOM. There's a lot happening there. Um, we will... So we don't, we're not attempting to, to enforce a standard or to change a standard. We're just going to take what we have, what exists, mm -hmm. and digitalize that. Just mm -hmm. keep it as simple as possible. Okay, okay. And so it, this process, uh, this involves users, devices, um, systems, so it's a it's a distributed system uh, in the end. And um, can you briefly tell us a bit more about the the device? So we'll start with the device. We look into the other systems as well. Uh, we will look at the architecture, but uh, let's focus on that device. Uh, what kind of device is it? How does it communicate? What kind of sensors does it have? What's the battery life? Things like that. Yeah, sure. So, so one important part of the of this this journey from A to B is the transit, where we would like um, to to be able to see and to measure and to record what's happening, um, so that in the event that something did happen, you would have a record. You could say, okay, it happened there and there because of that and that. And you could also perhaps prevent certain things if you can see, okay, the temperature has been rising or something like that. So um, we have, we're using a sensor which is um, ultra low power. Mm -hmm. um, it has a SIM card. Uh, battery life is, is approximately three months uh, okay. with simple AA batteries. Yeah. Um, at the same time, it is always online, always connected. Mm -hmm. So that gives us this, this um, continuous flow of data. Mm -hmm. And um, the sensor would be attached or, or mounted with the object so mm -hmm. that it's always in proximity of the object. Mm -hmm. And it would then track certain parameters. So um, it has an accelerometer. Mm -hmm. um, there's a um, humidity and temperature sensor. So mm -hmm. those are like the important um, yeah measurements that you want. You want to, to make sure temperature is not too high, not too low. Uh, you need certain, depending on what the object is, you, you want certain amount of humidity. Mm -hmm. And of course, shock, you know, yeah. if it's been dropped or if it's, there's some kind of movement. Mm -hmm. The data is then being gathered and is being sent with narrowband IoT to um, a platform, um, to the server, and we'll quickly look at the whole architecture. So now we talked about the device. Uh, we'll quickly look at the uh, architecture, so where this data is being sent. Um, but, but first, uh, in the lecture I always mention that hardware eventually uh, will fail. So what happens here if a hardware fails? If you have an artwork, there's a sensor, it's not running, or there are multiple sensors on them uh, and two are reporting something. A high temperature, one is uh, reporting low temperature. Um, how, how do you deal with that? Yeah, so the, the, 
Life's being able to understand if a sensor is working or not is an important aspect of, 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 the, of the approach, of course, because um, A, you don't want the sensor to have been compromised, and B, you want accurate data. Um, so this is an important part of, of the certify life cycle, uh, which can be used to make sure, okay, has it been tampered with? Is it still secure? Um, in the event that you find out the device has been tampered with, you would, you would typically shut it down. Um, but also, of course, you, you might have a situation where you have multiple sensors and you're getting different readings from these sensors. Mm -hmm. So again, there, they, they could be, I mean, it, it, it's of course possible that the readings are accurate and, and you have um, half the object is in the sun and the other half is in the shade. And so the, the readings are correct, that's possible. Um, but it's also possible that one of the readings is wrong. Uh, so let's say, for example, if you have perhaps more than just two, three or four sensors, um, that would then give you the option to say, okay, um, three of them are, are correspond with each other, one of them doesn't. Obviously, let's make the assumption that the one that isn't is, is not working mm -hmm. and shut it down. Okay, but this is resolved at the platform side. So Yes. The devices are not communicating with each other. Everything goes to the platform and then uh, it will be decided based on the data. Oh, yeah. okay, this might be faulty. I need to check this or... Yeah. Yes. Okay. Yes. okay. So uh, l let's dive into the architecture. Mm -hmm. um, let, let's have a look at that. Here down below, we have actually the device. We have um, some agents running on it at the station agent. Uh, authentication agent and uh, enforcement agent. We also have some monitoring running, uh, some tracers and sniffers. Uh, so this is based on raw data. And uh, one also crucial um, aspect is the bootstrapping. Maybe uh, you can tell us a bit more what bootstrapping is or, or why it's important. Yes, it's, in, it's important because um, during the bootstrapping phase of the device, you really need to go through a series of checks to make sure um, that, that the device is still working as it should, that it hasn't been um, manipulated in any way. You, you should then, what, what we do is, or what is part of this, this framework is that uh, a connection is established with um, a platform online, which then also does a series of checks, make sure that the device is the device it's saying, and establish then a secure connection, um, which would be available for for monitoring the device and monitoring the health of the device. Okay, and that also includes um, key exchange. Yeah. So that means um, the um, signature that is being produced is on the device itself. So the device yes. need to have a um, public-private key pair and uh, well for a signature it needs a private um, uh, key and uh, this is also installed or negotiated during this uh, bootstrapping phase yes yeah okay um, with respect to the um, security vulnerabilities uh, this is also part of this certify framework that um, as soon as devices with a certain firmware um, have some security issues, then it's also handled uh, appropriately. Yeah. Um, how does this work? So there is um, certain information is, is being collected and being kept up to date. It could be that, for example, the manufacturer might say, okay, that we've discovered an issue with these devices, with this firmware. It could also be that there is some kind of an exploit that's been discovered. Um, so as soon as that information is available and has been identified, and we can see that, okay, this is one of the devices that's been, is affected, uh, the next question is, okay, what do we do now? Do we, do we actually have to shut it down? Can we do a firmware update? What do we do? Okay. And um, these, these devices, they also have a kind of a, um, security chip in there, so yes. it's a trusted computing and um, it may also happen that this is for some reason broken, like um, you cannot trust this device anymore and uh, in that case I believe you mentioned uh, the device is being shut down um, in order not to generate some fake data yeah. 
Um, and it's better to have no data than wrong data yes. in that case. Yeah. Okay. Um, the data is then, as I mentioned, uh, sent over LTM or NB-IoT to the platform. Um, can you tell us a bit what happens at the platform, on the platform level? Yes, yeah, so the, the platform would uh, coordinate the um, exchange of information between different sources and the device. So, um, for example, we have the, the registry, which is a blockchain component, where we kind of keep a history of important events during the life cycle of the device. Um, we also have the um, publicly available um, data about exploits, security mm -hmm. issues. Um, I believe it's called the uh, CVE, um, Common Vulnerabilities and Exposures. There are lists out there that you can download and there are scanners that you can scan your system against and uh, see if there are any issues. The most recent, most prominent issue that was reported that got some attention is the XZ exploit where um, a party could smuggle in some um, code. Um, it, it was a compression algorithm, but the code managed to compromise SSH server. This was discovered over Easter. I will also report uh, in the news about this. And uh, this also got this number, so it's documented, uh, the versions are known, and this list is structure, uh, structurized, and um, this list can be then imported to certify, and then also check the device um, against this list. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Um, there are also, also information available from the manufacturer as well, in addition. Um, so there's a, a variety of, of sources, and um, the platform, is where this is, is monitored, is collated, and if necessary, then enforced onto the device, be mm -hmm. that, be that a, a, a software update or, or a shutdown. Okay, and now uh, we also, uh, often we talk about the good path, and, uh, but what happens if there is an artwork, it has a sensor on it, um, you know there's a vulnerability, but it's somehow it's in a tunnel or it's um, some place where it doesn't have con connectivity. Um, what can be done in, in that situation? So the, I mean, you can, what you can do is, I mean, the, there will not always be 100% online. It's, you, the assumption is that there will be <clears throat> periods where the device is, is not reachable or not mm -hmm. online for whatever reason. Um, so you have to, A, you've got to make sure that on the device side, that doesn't mean data is not being collected. Mm -hmm. And then obviously B, on, on the, on the um, enforcement side or the monitoring side, um, you have to make sure, okay, if it's going to be shut down, if it's not available, it gets shut down as soon as it is available. And we know at which point we can kind of say, okay, we don't trust this data anymore. Mm -hmm. um, and yeah, you just, you, you need to be able to continuously monitor. Is it on, offline? Is it, is it available? Mm -hmm. As soon as mm -hmm. it's available, you can take the action. Um, but you, you obviously, it won't be available. It won't be online all the time. That's yeah. a given. Yeah, yeah that, that's true. That's true. Uh, you also mentioned blockchain. Yes. that uh, important events they get recorded um, on the blockchain we'll be talking about blockchains i think in lecture 9 or 10 so we'll start with blockchain in the spring semester and then in the fall semester we'll have a whole lecture only about blockchain so there we're going to deep dive into blockchains so here we are also using uh, blockchains. Can you tell us a bit more about how you use it and uh, where do you use it? Yes, uh, of course. So the, um, the blockchain is specifically used for um, what we call the inventorying and, and registry component of the, of the Certify framework. Um, what we want to do is essentially we want to keep a record of um, events which are relevant in the lifecycle of the device. Um, 
it should be a blockchain because we'd like to make sure that these records are immutable by design. Mm -hmm. um, and it should then provide you with like, um, let's say a CV or a, or a biography of the device. Mm -hmm. Okay. And um, so when we talk about blockchains in the lecture, I will focus on, on public blockchains because I believe those blockchains have a much wider use case. Um, private blockchains, they also have use cases, but those use cases are quite narrow. Um, so how is it within Certify? Uh, it's a private blockchain. Um, there was a discussion about this. Um, there is an aspect where you might not want to expose all of the details of a device, um, but be that as it may, we're using a blockchain, so potentially it could become a, a public blockchain at some point. Yeah, yeah, we make sure that one, uh, if we develop this solution on a particular blockchain, uh, if it's a private one, um, it should be easy to uh, change from a private blockchain to a public one. So the solution is, is built in that way that we can switch eventually, but for now it's uh, on a private blockchain. Yes. Uh, do you know which blockchain? Uh, yes, the, the blockchain that we're using is um, Hyperledger Ares. Okay, so there will be this information. Um, I Also in the lecture, I will argue for public blockchains, but there are use cases also for private ones, but I, I'm more um, in favor of public blockchains because um, you have an inclusion, everyone can participate, there's a much wider audience and um, we'll make sure that if we build stuff on that, um, if it's a private, um, it can be switched later on. Um, with respect to the attestation, so you don't store all the temperature data in, in, in the blockchain because no. uh, that would be a bit too much. Um, I argue always about simplicity, so um, I'm trying to avoid complex systems. And um, if I look at the private blockchain, those typically bring in the complexity. Uh, most often um, it's easier to just have a simple database or kind of a storage where you can put the data and um, maybe you can even have a timestamp or, or even a hash. Um, but uh, a full-blown private blockchain is uh, sometimes it's uh, way too complex. But um, here in, in that case, um, when we're not sure private public, so we go for private first and then we, we make it compatible that it's, it can be used later on um, on a public blockchain. But uh, here again, if you design a system, please keep it simple. Uh, try to have the simple solution. Um, this is a project with multiple partners, so we try to get in all the views, all the um, options for, for technologies and this looks a bit more complex, complicated, um, but um, if you design such a system, uh, try to keep it as simple as possible. And also from the security point of view, such a system, now we have looked at the um, overall architecture here uh, with the uh, platform, with the device. And uh, when we, for example, talk, we talked about security, about the keys, then it would be interesting to have a different kind of a, a view on this um, project, like who has what key, uh, which key, or um, which device is signing what kind of data. So this would be then a sequence diagram showing how the keys go from one side to the other or who is signing what. So that would be from a security point of view quite interesting, which is not in this graph yet. Although this, this graph, so this architecture uh, looks a bit more complicated, it's actually quite simple and gives a quite good overview over the whole project. And it is a complicated project, complex projects. We have many partners, um, many of them from the academia, some of them from the industrial side. And um, I just want to point out that we are trying to uh, look at the good case. So this will be an MVP, a yeah. prototype. Yeah. 
Um, this will not be the full-blown solutions with everything that can go wrong will be anticipated, like with the sensors, that if a sensor is sending wrong kind of data or uh, this uh, two out of three um, could be implemented, but probably we focus on the, on the uh, good path. We make some assumptions uh, like the device, if it's running, it's running correctly things like that to map the, the good case and if this um, should be um, um, or, or if you want to have this um, as a production system then a lot more effort needs to be put in there to cover all the corner cases. Yep. Yeah that's the Certify project. Uh, thanks for having me here Simon. Thank you, it's been a pleasure. Thanks, and uh, yeah, that's uh, how uh, EU research projects, how such a distributed system looks like in this kind of setting. So again, I want to point out that complexity should be avoided in a system. So first, if you want to build a system, build a simple system. If you see the need for added complexity, add complexity. But um, if there's a possibility to avoid complexity, do so, because if you have complex systems, they are very, very difficult to manage.